Hello everyone, I hope you're having a good one today, and welcome back to Headcanon, a series in which I try to explain certain plot holes or uh, things that haven't been explained yet in the Star Wars canon or Legends universe for that matter. And today is going to be a little bit of a different episode. Uh, previously I've talked about very character specific, the character specific, there we go, uh, types of things, things like how is Rey so powerful, or how did Anakin become a Force ghost? In this, we're going to actually be reviewing uh, pretty much the top site that uh, pops up, or the top article, I should say, that pops up when you search Star Wars plot holes in Google. It's an article from NME.com, uh, written by a gentleman known as Larry Barlett, or Bartlett. I'm not sure if that first T is silent or not, so my apologies. Now, this isn't meant to be a bashing piece in any way, shape, or form. I'm not looking to say, oh, look at how stupid this guy is. Nothing like that at all. It's just that this provides me with a list of plot holes or things that can be perceived as plot holes that either I've already filled in with my own brain, you know, over the past 27 years of life, or because I'm... I have the knowledge because I'm addicted to Star Wars and I spend 90% of my time listening to Star Wars podcasts or audiobooks or something like that, which nobody can be expected to do. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. So it looks like Larry Bartlett here, uh, Mr. Bartlett, has organized the article into sections by film. Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Plot hole number 1, Qui-Gon Jinn is Obi-Wan's master. In Empire Strikes Back, Obi-Wan's ghost tells Luke that Yoda was the Jedi Master who instructed me. And then he goes on to... Larry Bartlett goes on to basically explain it himself, actually. Uh, means that Yoda taught him when he was a youngling. Uh, as Yoda is seen doing in uh, Attack of the Clones. Which, that's kind of how I've always thought of that. I mean, it seems like the Jedi curriculum, you know, from... Youngling to Padawan to Knight to Master is very similar to like what trade schools are for us here in our world. Uh, you go to a classroom setting where you're in a class of people, and then once you graduate from that class, you go on to apprentice underneath a uh, master electrician or a master plumber or a master carpenter or something like that. So I think that. That was just Obi-Wan referring to Yoda when he was teaching him in a classroom setting before Obi-Wan was set up to be with Qui-Gon. So, on to number two. In the prequel films, Yoda explains the rule of two. Uh, and then the issue seems to be that uh, it's interesting to see Vader and Sidious looking to recruit Luke when there's only supposed to be two Sith. I think that Vader is just kind of willing to go along with uh, whatever um, Sidious wants to do. And Sidious is expecting Luke to kill Vader and then become his new Vader, his new little attack dog. So I think that we're going to, I think that this could be explained away either that way or another way of seeing it is that it could just be that Sidious doesn't care. Yes, the rule of two is a thing, but he breaks it all the time. I mean, you got Dooku, and then he allows Dooku to have Ventress, and so on and so forth. I think that uh, Sidious has kind of given up on the rule of two. He just wants his own power. He doesn't want any apprentice to ever get rid of him at all. Now, this next one is a valid concern. Number three is Anakin was conceived by Parthenogenesis. His mother says he has no father. I'm not going to say the subtext because that's uh, not family friendly, <laughs> but uh, now there are two prevailing theories on this. Number one of which is that Anakin was born of the Force. The Force needed to make him to deal with the imbalance in the Jedi and then destroy the Sith 20 years later. Uh, then there's also the other theory, in which is Legends, where Anakin was actually created by Sidious and Sidious' master, Plagueis, uh, in some sort of creepy ritual thing. 
either way, I think that both of those are pretty convincing arguments for this one. I think that that is a good way to explain it, at least for me. So plot hole number four, according to this article, is why do the droids have a hierarchical system? Why do they have lieutenants, corporals, and this, that, and the other thing? Very valid point. Um, I've always seen it as that... I mean, you do have that droid control ship in Episode One, which is what Anakin destroys, and that saves all the Gungans and all that kind of stuff. But I've always thought of it almost as uh, kind of like cloud computing that you see in, like, libraries or uh, universities or whatever where it's lots of little virtual machines being run on one piece of hardware that's doing all the computing power. And I kind of think that the sergeants and the lieutenants are there primarily as uh, subsystems to control their subsystems, in other words. So you've got the main big droid control ship that is controlling everything or doing all the computing power, but then you have sergeants and lieutenants and whatnot controlling all the tiny little drones. Onwards to episode two, Attack of the Clones. Complaint number five. Padme instinctively knows where Anakin is somehow. The article here is referencing when Padme falls out of the gunship and then knows where Anakin and Obi-Wan went uh, afterward. I always thought that that clone trooper that she like meets after she falls out of the gunship just kind of told her like, that trooper received information from some of the troopers that were with Anakin and Obi-Wan. And so he relayed that information to Padme, and then Padme went there. And now, Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. Complaint number 6. Existing canon suggests Leia knew her mother. This is referring to Episode 6, actually, when... Uh, Leia suggests that, you know, she knew her, that she did remember her birth mother, mother as beautiful, kind, and sad. Now, I think that this comes from mostly Leia's uh, Force abilities uh, in Bloodline and in the Aftermath series and even in non-canon stuff. Leia is very good at empathizing and getting feelings from people. So I think that um, she knew her mother when she was in the womb. So I think that she knew her mother was beautiful and kind and then sad mostly because of the Clone Wars. And then even after Leia was born for those few minutes, she does see her mom dying, you know, as a very, very small baby. But she doesn't remember anything specific. Leia even says so. She just remembers what uh, Padme as a series of images and feelings, which to me, I think that I think that that kind of pretty well, that's that's my offering to you, at least. Wow, we skipped straight through the prequels. Uh, onwards to episode four, A New Hope. Number seven, Vader has no idea about his children. Uh, several times in the original trilogy, the Skywalker children are shown to be able to sense one another, and Vader is shown to be able to communicate with Luke telepathically. So, why didn't Vader realize that Leia was his daughter when he had her on the Death Star in Episode 4? It's a valid criticism, but I've always seen that telepathy stuff as... it's You have to be in balance with yourself to be able to use that. And uh, actually, I'll leave a description down below for my uh, how Vader turned into Force Ghost Anakin uh, down in the description to talk more about being in balance with yourself. But I think that he, Vader, didn't really uh, know that ability anymore. He kind of forgot about it until he wanted to know more about Luke when he learned about Luke through conventional means uh, in the Darth Vader comic. So in conclusion with this one, I'm going to have to say that it, it just doesn't quite work like radar, and Vader's antenna was broken anyways, basically. Number eight. Luke keeps his dad's name. I got nothing. That I mean, you you could say that Anakin would or Vader would never go back to Tatooine in fear of being reminded of Anakin. But he lives on Mustafar in Rogue One. So, 
Mustafar would remind him of his failures as Anakin anyways, so why would he be afraid of going to Tatooine? And he has no problem going to Tatooine in the Darth Vader comic. So... Yeah, if, if you guys could come up with something, let me know down in the comments below, because actually now that's going to bother me until I can figure it out. Ooh, this is a good one. Imperials should have shut down the droid's escape pod. This is a very valid criticism, and I wish if I had a super easy explanation for you, but I'll try. For me, my headcanon for this is that uh, the Imperial captain wants to basically plant evidence for the plan that Vader wants to set into motion that he outlines in the next scene about staging uh, the blockade runner's uh, demise as an accident, essentially. So an intact escape pod that malfunctioned and jettisoned on the planet might be pretty decent. Might be pretty decent evidence, I mean. Number 10. Obi-Wan doesn't recognize R2, a droid he spent three films with. Yes, I agree. Uh, Mr. Bartlett. Rude. Very rude. <laughs> I'm... I... I think that that could be explained with Obi-Wan's uh, caginess in Episode 4. He clearly lies outright to Luke. Uh, it could be that he's pretending, or it could just be that Obi-Wan sees R2 as a toaster. In the same way that we would see a microwave or our uh, cell phones. So number 11, the Death Star faffs around. Nobody uses faffs around. People need to use faffs around more. Use faffs around more. Uh, faffs around for 10 minutes at the end. Uh, basically, why didn't the Death Star just blow up the actual gas giant of Yavin instead of trying to orbit around and then shoot Yavin 4? Or why didn't it just jump into where it did have a clear shot to Yavin 4? I think that uh, the Imperials didn't know uh, that the Death Star could be destroyed, so they weren't very worried about the piddly little rebel forces that could come at it, you know, and could attack it. And so I think that they weren't really interested in making extra jumps to get away or to get uh, a good uh, field of fire, essentially. And then the idea of them just blowing up the planet in its way, there's two issues with that. Number one is that um, we're talking about a gas giant, which is many hundreds or thousands of times larger than just a standard terrestrial planet like Yavin 4 or uh, Jetta or Scarif or Alderaan. So I'm not sure if the Death Star laser could destroy Yavin. Also, uh, I imagine that if they did try it, it could end up causing some sort of catastrophic uh, explosion that could end up destroying the Death Star as well. They might not be able to fire close enough to it and still survive an explosion of Yavin, uh, Yavin proper, the gas giant. And third, the first Death Star could only charge its laser once every day. It could basically do one shot a day essentially, and then uh, it's, all of its power reactors would need to re, uh, recharge. All right, episode five, The Empire Strikes Back. Luke gets past the blockade on Hoth without a hitch. And this is regarding when Luke is actually taking off and then he goes off to Dagobah. Now, to me, my head cannon is basically that that big ion cannon that was clearing the way it just happened to clear a wide enough path that Luke didn't even need to worry about it. Luke was one of the last ones out. So by that time, there were already, you know, six, seven, eight, a dozen Star Destroyers already disabled that he just flew by that just didn't happen to be in the camera's range. That's kind of how I've always explained that to myself. Number 13, Darth Vader only disables the Falcon's hyperdrive, not the whole engine. In Cloud City, the Millennium Falcon's hyperdrive is disabled by Darth Vader's men, but that doesn't prevent them escaping. Why not just damage the engines beyond repair, too? Another good one. Uh, let me know down in the comments down below. I have no idea. I'd have, I'd, I'd, um, maybe because Vader is 
arrogant and thinks that just disabling the hyperdrive is kind of a an insurance measure. But if you're going to do insurance, why don't you just make absolutely certain? Yeah, I don't know. Let me know. <laughs> All right. Episode four, Return of the Jedi. Number 14, droid torture scene. In other words, really? Droids have pain receptors? Really? I kind of see this as that they might, actually. I mean, droids are subjugated beings in the Star Wars universe, so why wouldn't they have pain receptors, or at least something similar to pain receptors, uh, in order to do exactly what Jabba is doing uh, to these poor droids? It's definitely meant to... Uh, get them to do what he wants them to do. So I think that having um, pain receptors would be not that bad. I mean, I think that it would be logical for them to have pain receptors. So to me, that's at least how I've always explained it. Number 15, Luke uses a skull to push a button instead of just using the force. Here's a... Um, 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 actually... In the Return of the Jedi um, audio drama, he actually does use the Force. He guides the skull to the button, essentially. He basically improves his accuracy with it. Also, I'm not sure if you would have a great amount of concentration when you have a 70-foot uh, tall Rancor <laughs> bearing down on you. I, I might not be able to concentrate enough to be able to articulate pushing a button, but I could uh, concentrate enough to just kind of nudge a skull in the right direction. <laughs> At least, again, that's another one of those, that's how, I tell, that's how I tell it in my own head. Number 16, Luke asks Han if he can reach his lightsaber instead of just using the Force. I think that, I mean, you see all these gestures and stuff, right? Uh, you know, if you do a mind trick, you do this, you do a Force push, you do that, whatever. I think that that all comes from the subconscious uh, visualization of what you want the Force to do for you. So when your, you know, arms are flailing outside of a net, you can't really, you know, get the lightsaber to move because your arms are all the way out here. You can't just do the, you know, hold your hand like this and then have it fly to your hand. At least that's kind of how I see it. Number 17. Ewoks have a dress and lay aside and they give it to her immediately. Well, the Ewoks are very are clearly very, very friendly murder bears. And they're, they wear hide clothing, so I don't see it as uh, impossible that they just made it real quick. I mean, you can make a, a garment if you're practiced at it. Even without machinery, you could make a garment within a couple of hours if you're fairly well practiced at it, so I think that uh, having uh, the Ewok simply make her a custom dress within a couple of hours makes sense to me. Number 18. The Emperor leaked the real Death Star plans to the Rebellion. The infamous Star Wars line, it's a trap, went, was down to this plot hole. It was indeed a trap and not a very good one. The Re Emperor gave the Rebels accurate Death Star plans so he could wear them out. Uh, there's two bits about this that I'm not quite comfortable with. Uh, number one is he's talking about, the, the author of this article is talking about plans. Uh, I think that it's not, it's about knowing where it is, knowing the general, uh, tactical situation on Endor and above Endor not about the actual plans for the second Death Star. I mean, they just kind of fly into it and fly blindly through it and hoping to find the reactor core. Uh, I think that it's also just a testament to Sidious's uh, arrogance. He's insolent, essentially. He has no respect for the rebels in any way, shape, or form. And he has his big, mighty new toy. Uh, so he's not worried about it. He also has his entire fleet with him, too. So, episode number seven, Force Awakens. 
Number 19, Poe Dameron inexplic inexplicably for them, survives his crash landing on Jakku and magically returns to the Resistance. That's explained in, I believe, the novelization and kind of explained-ish in Star Wars uh, Lego The Force Awakens or Lego Star Wars The Force Awakens. I think that uh, that wasn't necessarily a plot hole. I think it was more of a... I mean, I can see how it would take somebody out of the movie. I think that it should have been included on screen. I mean, five more minutes of screen time of Poe. Yes, please. But uh, I don't see it as a... a a ruining factor. It's just, it's a small weakness. Number 20, Han has never used Chewie's bowcaster. Again, a valid concern about uh, the franchise. You know, Han and Chewie have spent quite a bit of time together. Were you serious that Han's never used Chewie's bowcaster before? I think it's just kind of never come up. I mean, it's a little bit odd that it's never come up, but... I definitely think that it's a possibility that it's never come up. Is it in the minority? Is it lower than a 50% chance? Yeah. But it could just be that uh, Han never had the need to use Chewie's bowcaster until that day. You know, even after 45 years of them knowing each other, they've never need to worry about it, so... Eh. Number 21, Maz Kanata is infinitely wise, but doesn't notice two spies uh, reading into, uh, Lord, I can't remember her name, but the the, the Resistance droid guy and uh, what's her name, uh, Lord, the character from, oh, excuse me, Perfect Weapon uh, by Delilah Dawson. I can't remember her name, but uh, this is kind of along the lines of uh, with uh, Vader not knowing that Luke and Leia are his kids. Again, to me, it's not really radar. It's just you have to kind of concentrate to do these kind of sensing things, these kind of telepathic things. So it's just that Maz Kanata never bothered to pay attention to those two characters. You know, she's got tons and tons and tons of scum and villainy in her bar or her way station. So why would she she wouldn't be able to look at every single one of them. Or she does know that they're there, but uh, isn't that worried about it, I guess. I don't know. All right, number 22, Ray learns to use the Force just like that. I'm going to cheat and give you a much longer, much more in-depth uh, explanation for this, because otherwise we're going to have a hour-long video. Uh, I can't really explain it to you guys in this video because there's a ton of different theories out there for that, but I will link a video down in the description down below that I did earlier. It was actually the first episode of Headcanon. Why is Ray so powerful or how is Ray so powerful? I don't even remember what I named it anymore, but go ahead and check that out for an explanation to number 22 here. Number 23, Ray understands the Wookiee language as well as many, many more. I think that that could just be explained, at least to me, in my head. I see it as Ray knows all these languages because of the diversity of uh, creatures and aliens and humans and non-humans and whatever all over Jeddah. You know, people have come here to try and make money. They get stuck there in, in you know, indentured servitude. And, well, that creates a massive melting pot of tons and tons and tons of different characters and so she was forced to learn a ton of different languages to survive. Number 24, R2-D2 and C-3PO know each other. In Rogue One, in the Rogue One scene, before they go to Leia's ship and join the battle above Scarif, R2 and C-3PO are shown talking to one another. In A New Hope, about 20 minutes later, they suddenly don't know each other. I have to be completely blunt and honest. I never got the feeling that they didn't know each other in A New Hope. Uh, C-3PO even, like, says to Luke uh, at the Lars homestead, and this is my counterbot, R2-D2. They seem to know each other in A New Hope, so why wouldn't they know each other in Rogue One? I thought that it would be a little bit different there. At least that's, that's my interpretation. And finally, number 25, Leia, an important diplomatic figure, is at the last ditch an intensely dangerous battle above Scarif. Again, valid criticism. Uh, that is uh, another one of those, um, actually, 
ones where it's explained in the novelization for Rogue One by Alexander Freed. In that novel, the blockade runner, Leia's ship, is docked aboard the Profundity for repairs. And then Admiral Raddus basically takes them along for the ride. They don't really want to go, but they kind of have to go because they, their, their hyperspace or their hyperdrive isn't working. They got no more go-go, so they're kind of stuck where they are. It's almost as if uh, Admiral Raddus, I love Admiral Raddus, by the way, it's almost as if Admiral Raddus forgot that they were in his cargo bay, which, you know, uh, hey, it is what it is. Uh, Admiral Raddus clearly isn't the most lawful of characters for all you D&D uh, friends out there. Well, and that does it for top 25 Star Wars plot holes that could ruin the movies for you. Again, this wasn't meant to be a bashing piece or a uh, uh, slanderous piece. This is just a convenient resource for me to find plot holes that I might not identify as plot holes. Thank you guys so much for your time. I hope that you enjoyed. Be sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed this type of content from me. Hit subscribe too because I'm going to be having lots of fun with uh, uh, Rebel Rising and Guardians of the Wills next week. Both of those drop on Tuesday. So I will be getting reviews out for those to you guys as well. Thank you guys so much. And as always, may the Force be with you.